So we were talking about this interview that Donald Trump did earlier this week. It was in Iowa, a radio show in Iowa. The former president was asked about the possibility of jail time stemming from special counsel Jack Smith's investigation. Here is Trump's answer. Is it something that concerns you of, of you know, of the people making sure that they don't go out of their right mind if something like that happens? Because I know what I'm thinking of could happen if that, for example, they do say Jack Smith says, OK, I'm going to put Donald Trump in jail. I think it's a very dangerous thing to mm -hmm. even talk about okay. uh, because we do have a tremendously a passionate group of voters. And I mean, maybe, you know maybe a hundred a hundred and fifty I've never seen anything like it mm -hmm. much more passion than they had in 2020 and much more passion than they had in 2016 I think uh, it would be very dangerous Joe much more passion than they had in 2020 implying it could be even worse yeah. than you saw around the 2020 election obviously just appallingly dangerous stuff to say given the recent history in this country and also as you pointed out earlier very stupid as he perhaps comes um, under indictment here for the events around the 2020 election. Yeah, I, I don't know if Donald Trump understands. What does he think he's doing? Well, he's talking like a mobster. Yeah. It'd be a shame if uh, it'd be very dangerous for Jack Smith. And wouldn't want another riot. Wouldn't want to, and they're more dangerous now than they were in 2020 or 2016. Could be worse. Gene, um, he's just so stupid. He yeah. really is. Yeah. He just doesn't mm -hmm. understand he's going up against the feds. He doesn't understand yeah. that he can't bully and bluster and threaten his way out of criminal charges that are coming because he broke the law, because yeah. he stole nuclear secrets, because he stole secret plans to attack Iran, because he stole secret military secrets, because he has people all around him all around him on January the 6th that are testifying against him. No Democrats, no moderate Republicans, all Trumpers, all the yeah. Trump, everybody that he ha ever hired has gone before the grand jury. Everybody that was around him January the 6th went before the grand jury, all Trumpers. And he's gonna be charged for some of the most yeah. serious crimes in America and his response his response, instead of talking to his lawyer saying, hey, get me a deal. I don't know what it's going to look like, but get me a deal because they've got me dead to right. My own people are the people testifying against me. Get me a deal. Instead of that, he goes on an Iowa radio show and like a mobster threatens Jack Smith. Has he not looked at pictures of Jack Smith? <laughs> this yes. guy looks like the judge on Andor, all right? Yes. He looks yes. like the guy that takes the good guy yeah. from the Star Wars galaxy and throws him into jail for life. He doesn't yes. understand. Oh my God, look, I'm scared. You just scared me by putting this picture yeah. up. Yeah, like, yeah. What he, does he, he think? He looks, does him. he think Jack Smith is going to be intimidated by mob-like threats, Gene? Yeah, and and that's not going to happen. Jack Smith looks like a pretty intense guy, and he and he, <laughs> and he looks like uh, he's not going to take any of this from Donald Trump. I think Trump does, does doesn't know what else to do. He obviously sees the walls closing in on him. Uh, the indictment's coming. Someone must have told him, uh, let him know what the conviction rate is in uh, in federal court, which is well over 90 percent of, of defendants who are charged uh, either plead guilty or get convicted. I mean, it is, uh, it, this is a, t a tough situation for him. And rather than then, then make a deal, and rather than try to, you know, somehow keep his freedom, uh, he he does this. It can only make things worse for him. It can only make things worse for him. But he he just doesn't know what else to do. That's I know uh, but it, he's yeah. going to run harder and harder and harder uh, to win the presidency again, uh, so he can try to pardon himself. That's um, th th I think that's his his ultimate move. It's reminiscent of the stand back and stand by that he said to the, to the Proud Boys. And there's a lot of, you know, I think uh, I will agree with Joe on this one point, although Heilman just tell, texted me and told me not to let you mal mal me um, about the Monmouth Bowl. Uh, but the, um, 
he says that, you know, so he said what he said yesterday, very mob-like, right? But uh, he did a, another interview earlier in the week where he was asked, like, well, it seems like you kind of like these indictments. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, it bothers me, right? It was like a little moment of vulnerability that he was showing that, <laughs> you know, that this, this stuff is, is getting to him. So we have everybody whining about how Joe Biden's going to do so terribly. And we have everybody whining about a third party candidate. We have everybody whining about everything because this is what the Democrats do. Yeah. Um, uh, it's the Obama administration, but when their campaign talked about bedwetting, excessive bedwetting going on there. Um, um, and the polls, we showed a poll yesterday showing that Donald Trump losing, losing by five points to mm -hmm. Joe Biden, 49 to 44%. Another one came out, which media said it calls a brutal, brutal poll showing. Joe Biden crushing Donald Trump, even with a third party candidate. Well, that's the interesting part here. Despite having some concerns about both President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump, new polling shows most Americans are not open to voting for a third party ticket in 2024. In the latest Monmouth University survey, just 30 percent of registered voters say they would definitely or probably consider voting third party if Biden and Trump are the leading names on the 2024 ballot. As for how a nameless third party ticket could impact a 2024 rematch between the current and former president, the poll shows it may actually help Biden. Without a third party option, the survey shows Biden beating Trump by seven points, 47% to 40%. With a third party ticket on the ballot, ballot Biden's victory over Trump grows to nine points, 37% to 28%. So, so, Willie, looking at this, I mean, first of all, I mean, this is the second day we have polls up that show Joe Biden easily beating Donald Trump, uh, thumping him. And on this third party uh, ballot, we, we're all thinking it's going to hurt Joe Biden, it's going to hurt Joe Biden, people that are with Donald Trump. It doesn't look that way here. It doesn't look this way in some other polls. It, it looks like people are saying, I, I don't like Donald Trump at all. Give me another option. I'll never vote for Joe Biden. I'll never vote for a Democrat. But give me a third party option. And we actually see there, there's some actual softness in Donald Trump's numbers and Joe Biden looking better than ever. Yeah, that cuts against the conventional wisdom, everything we've been hearing, which is if someone like Joe Manchin were to jump in the race, it would only hurt um, Joe Biden and help to get Donald Trump reelected to be president. So, Jen Palmieri, I'm curious how you read into those numbers, because every other poll we've seen says people don't like the matchup. They don't like their choices. They don't want Donald Trump against Joe Biden and they don't want to see this movie again. And yet, when you actually put the question directly to them, 30% of them want to see a third party, but it actually helps Joe Biden. And again, in that head to head, I think it was seven points again. The one we saw yesterday was five points. You have Joe Biden up seven points in this Monmouth poll over Donald Trump. So for all the panicking, as Joe says, that's been going on in the Democratic Party, those numbers, at least in these last several polls, look pretty good for Joe Biden. So I was just looking at my phone because I already have two text messages from Democrats who I don't like to use the term bedwinning because I find it crude, but who are very who are freaking out <laughs> about uh, this poll because uh, that is what Democrats do, Joe. You're right. We do freak out, but it's also why there's still a republic standing because we over worry about uh, about elections and what's going to happen in them. This is this is interesting. I'm not sure that I trust it. It's the first time I've seen a poll where there is a third party option that did benefit Biden as opposed to uh, Trump, although or, or at least just didn't hurt Biden. Um, but there is, you know, but there is a lot of concern that if you have that that Trump's numbers and every other poll that I've seen has showed this are very strong. And if you have um, and if there are people have a third party option that that is likely to take away from Biden because Biden is winning some disgruntled Republicans and um, independents over now. Continuing in the role of the party pooper here for Democrats, I'll say, talking about the poll from yesterday, which had Biden winning 49-45 uh, uh, over Trump, that's a national poll, that's great. When you look at battleground states, and I'll use Wisconsin as an example, you know, you gotta get to 270. These states are not static, they're changing. And so Wisconsin, for example, has a higher level of white non-college educated voters in 2024 than it had in 2020. That 
cohort of voters, you know, has, has favored Trump as opposed to Biden. So these poll numbers are all great, but you know, you still have to bat, you know, you still got to get to 270. And there's concerns about when you look underneath the hood, what those numbers are going to be like in each of these battleground states. And then in terms of the third party, you know, great, only 30 percent are open to voting for uh, a, a, you know, either you know, just third party option. But Jill Stein only needed to get in the very small digits uh, of support in Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Pennsylvania to win the election for Donald Trump. So I think yes. the third party still remains a very, very significant threat to Joe Biden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the PTSD is strong with this one. Well, Skywalker. there's no P about it, Joe. There is no <laughs> curse about it. It's just traumatic it's, stress. Exactly. It is, it, it is. It is traumatic stress. Sam, why didn't she just say on the two best days of polling for Joe Biden, why didn't she just say, we don't deserve good things. <laughs> Where Republicans say, we may not deserve it, but we're going to take it. That when you see these polls, you're looking at it going, well, this is a trend line in a positive direction. You know, no. happy days are here again. When you look at, when I look at Wisconsin, why do I see? I see a judge's race that conservatives called the most important race in that state in a decade. And Democrats won by 11 points. Yes, things are not static. Things are breaking. Maybe it's because I'm not a Democrat. I'm still an independent, so I'm not over overly negative yet. Things are breaking in Democrats' way. They won by a landslide in Wisconsin. Judicial race that Republicans called the most important race of their time. Uh, Democrats won in Kansas. They won. They won in Kentucky on abortion. They have so many things that are breaking their way. Not just the indictments, but the row, uh, the overturning of row. So many things good going in their direction. And Donald Trump is looking crazier and crazier every day. That's why I always I don't talk about national polls. I usually talk about the. suburbs of Atlanta, they'll never go for Trump again. The suburbs of Philly, they'll never go for Trump again. The suburbs of Detroit, they'll never go for Trump again. The suburbs of Milwaukee, they'll never go for Trump again, especially post Roe. And I hope the power of positive thinking did not trigger Jen or any other <laughs> Democrats out there. But look, it's okay to be happy. It's okay to smile. It's no, okay it's not. to be positive, Sam. <laughs> no, oh, it's not. Oh, okay. Hell no. <laughs> Tell us why, well, Sam. First of all, let me let me just agree with Jen. Uh, bedwetting is a crude, disgusting term. It should be banished from the airwaves. <laughs> Let's get never mention it again. And secondly, uh, Jen did make, you know, uh, I think a very valid, if not, you know, maybe cup half empty uh, case for being optimist uh, for Democrats uh, heading into 2024. Uh, it is a race yeah. in certain states. It's not a national race, right? Like you have to look at Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. I, and this, I guess, would be a question I would sort of direct to Eugene here, which is, you know, if you look at that third party ticket, right, and you're scared mm -hmm. about it, it's, you know, there's not you have to look at two third party tickets right like there's the mansion one that's no labels it yeah. would draw it would draw centrist and maybe republicans who will be open to biden it could draw them away from biden but the other one is a cornell west type right who could take you know a couple percentage points maybe a few key thousand votes in critical states away from biden in what jen is you know reliving uh, a sort of like jill stein scenario right uh and i don't want to trigger it again but that is what happened um you are plugged in gene you know the people in the white house which one do they actually fear the most right like, like do they fear the the the, the, the mansion type run or do they fear the cornell west small percentage points uh liberal enthusiasm being just drained from them well, the answer, of course, because they're Democrats, is both. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but, but before I get to that, though, let me, um, I'm, I'm shocked that we haven't yet mentioned, we're, we're 12 minutes into the show, we haven't mentioned the one real big story in Washington today, which is the NFL owners approved the sale of the yes. Washington football <laughs> team, the commander oh, from yes. Dan Snyder, yeah, to Josh Harris. <laughs>
for us. The our long national nightmare is over, uh, and um, uh, you know every, the, everything is bright and sunny again. So yes. um, our own malignant <laughs> clown show is over. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, so let's all, you know, so how, how can anybody uh, have negative thoughts on a day like that? I, I, it's just, it's, it's amazing. I, it, Good question. You know, third party, um, I, I, my general view has been that a third party would probably hurt Joe Biden. But now we have some data indicating maybe it wouldn't. I think that's a good thing, and uh, and I think um, the, the, I think the polling has been good, has just been good for Biden, and I'm perfectly willing to to say, you know, great, um, uh, and 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 spend a day not worrying. I, my my uh, <laughs> resolution for today is not to worry and to, and to celebrate uh, the end uh, of a terrible era here in Washington football. Vice President Kamala Harris will visit Florida today to address the state's new standards for teaching black history in schools. Earlier this week, the state's Board of Education approved new guidelines that includes teaching students that some black people benefited from slavery because it taught them useful skills. The White House says the vice president now will deliver remarks in Jacksonville to highlight the administration's efforts to, quote, protect fundamental freedoms. The visit comes just a day after Harris's speech in Indianapolis, where she blasted states that are banning books. And speaking of our children, extremists pass book bans to prevent them from learning our true history. Book bans. Speaking of our children, extremists. Pass book bans to prevent them from learning our true history. Book bans in this year of our Lord 2023. And while they do this, check it out. They push forward revisionist history. Just yesterday in the state of Florida, they decided middle school students will be taught that enslaved people benefited from slavery. They insult us in an attempt to gaslight us, and we will not stand for it. Joining us now, the host of MSNBC's Politics Nation, president of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton. Rev, good morning. I had to dig in and read this because the headline I thought couldn't be true, but here it is, a 216-page document from the Florida State Board of Education, one section that reads, slaves develop skills which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefits. I never thought I'd see both sidesism of slavery taught in public schools. Well, it is not only insulting, it is humiliating. And it really is dangerous because it will instruct young people if it is allowed to go forward. Uh, not only a distorted uh, version of American history, but it robs us from seeing where we are. When you see the vice president going to Florida today to really uh, give national spotlight to this, it, it shows also how far the country's gone that you have a first time in the history of the country, a woman and a black woman, a woman of color as vice president that came from uh, a history of slavery. So to distort how brutal slavery is, is like saying an abused woman, a man say I abused her because I was trying to get her bad uh, lineage out of her, her family curses out of her. I mean, it, it is absolutely absurd, insulting, and it is not only a distortion of American history, but it robs from us the progress that we have made, therefore the progress we must continue. Uh, and I couldn't think of anything more egregious to do to young people. So I'm glad that uh, the vice president is going to Florida to underline this. Well, and, and talking about both sidesism, uh, Ralph, you, you actually have also the requirement for teachers to engage in both sidesism, to talk about, like, for instance, uh, the, the infamous 1920 
uh, massacre in Florida that that actually was described by many as as one of the, the the most single bloody days in American history for this type of massacre against black people. Uh, the guidelines say that teachers must also teach acts of violence in in massacres like this against black people, where black pe what acts of violence black people may have committed uh, in in that massacre. Again, a massacre against black people in Florida because a black man tried to vote. This would be akin to saying, if you're in Warsaw, you must teach uh, not only how the Nazis massacred the Jews, but if if the Jews did anything in the Warsaw ghetto uprising to try to defend themselves against the Nazi massacre, you must teach those acts of violence against Nazi stormtroopers as well. It's just, grotesque. it is so grotesque and obscene, yeah, Rev. I mean, it's, it's, it's just unthinkable that this is happening in 2023, but this is Ron DeSantis' Florida and could be Ron DeSantis' America. It is absolutely Ron DeSantis' Florida. And when we look at that, he is the most, uh, the second most uh, uh, popular candidate, or, or as according to the polls, even though he's a distance from uh, uh, Trump. So your choice is Trump or DeSantis, who's brought about this in this country at this time. Those of us that want to rise above that have to really push back like the vice president's visit and stand together. I, I mean, you and I came from different political perspectives, but stand together. That's why Martin Luther King III and I have invited you to be our guest in Washington for the March on Washington commemorating on August 26th to show that there are people that will stand together and tell the truth about what happened in the country so we can heal. You can't bring the country together unless we're honest about what happened. Yes, tell both sides, but tell both sides in a real way. Don't try to equate uh, things that are not uh, equal and not fair. You, you know, Joe, one of the things that I, I was saying to someone last night when, when I uh, got the call the vice president was going. It's very personal to many of us. In 2007, a New York paper, the New York Daily News, did a, uh, a whole tr a tracing of my background, found out that my family was owned by a family in Edgefield, South Carolina, Alexander Sharpton. That's who my great-grandfather was owned by. And I went down and visited Edgefield. I even saw the plantation my great-grandfather worked at. It never occurred to me till that day, every time I write my name or hear my name, I am saying the name of the owners of my great-grandfather. That's not our name. We don't know our name. That's the property name of us. That's how personal it is. So the think that my grandson or, or, or whomever in my family in Florida could learn this benefited us, that we didn't even know our names, we didn't know our history, and was able, was able to, uh, was made to work with no wages and act like there was some benefit to that. It's a personal so slap sick. in the face of all Americans, and we all ought to resist it and stand together like you and I have, Joe. I am too. But what if I told you being tired was a good thing when you're a sleeping giant and needing a moment to breathe is necessary when you breathe life into this country? What if I told you there was a win just on the other side of tomorrow? Would you give up then? What if I told you you were the heartbeat of this country? Always have been, always will be the most powerful thing it never created. What would you do? How would you feel? Would you feel how much you are loved? Would you feel how much you are feared? Or would you realize you faced more than this already and you've won every time? That's a snippet of an ad by the newly launched hybrid PAC, Rolling Sea Action Fund. The PAC supports the Congressional Black Caucus. Its goal is to mobilize black voters ahead of the 2024 election in an effort to flip the House back to a Democratic majority. Joining us now, Rolling Sea Action Fund Executive Director Nakara Campbell Wallace. She's the former political director for the Congressional Black 
Caucus PAC, and it's good to have you. We saw the ad. Talk more, if you could, about what the strategy is to make that a reality. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. And so Rolling Sea Action Fund is my love letter to black voters. It is really making sure that we understand that black voters are the cornerstone of the Democratic Party, but also champions of American democracy. And when black voters turn out, you know, democracy wins. And so for everyone who's watching us back home, please check us out on rollingsea.org. So uh, Nakar, that, that's a you know, that's a great ad and then it's very moving and inspirational. It's, it's sort of different for political ads. It's yes. like taking it time to take a different approach. There's a lot of Democrats that are concerned about drop off in uh, support for Biden among black voters, drop off in support for Republicans generally, numbers for Trump and uh, inching up in the African-American community. Talk about what you think that's, uh, you know, why that's happening and what you all are going to try to do to combat that in 24. For sure. You know, black voters, when you talk to them frequently, often and early, they turn out in droves. We turn out 80 to black 90 women, percent black women. Women. Black women. women are the best voters in America, right? The Super most heroes. consistent yes. voters in America from yes. either party. Yeah. Yes. And so we're going to make sure that we're talking to them early, frequently, with this always on engagement strategy. targeting districts that have a, about 8% or more black voting age population, because we know that when, when, we, when black America wins, America wins. Nicara, is there any um, geographical focus to this effort? Uh, it, you know, are you, are you focusing on the, on the big metros, um, in Philadelphia, Atlanta, where's the focus? Where black people are, we're talking to them. So that means rural voters, that means urban voters. We know that black people are not a monolith. And so I'm a product of that. My family's from Texas, my mom's from Baltimore, you know, my family's from everywhere. So we're gonna make sure we're talking to black people in the Midwest, the South, the North, everywhere. <laughs> Nikara, good morning. It's great to have you on the show. I'm curious. I know just like every other voter in the country, it's the economy for black voters and how that's going. And things do seem to be getting better. Inflation, we got a, a good number last week for the country that's down. But what else beyond the economy do you feel like black voters are focused on as they head into the, into the voting booth next year? I think that we're focused on voting rights. We're focused on this extreme Supreme Court that has now attacked affirmative action. They have attacked everything about us. And so now we know we have to fight like hell to make sure that we protect American democracy. All right, Rolling Sea Action Fund Executive Director Nakara Campbell-Wallace, thank you very much for being on this morning. We'll be following every step of the way. Significant update in the classified documents trial against former President Donald Tr uh, Trump. Judge Aileen Cannon just filed a document announcing a date for the trial for the Mar-a-Lago documents case. And that date is that the case will begin May 20th, 2024 in Fort Peace, Florida. There are also numerous court dates prior to trial listed for various motion so a lot will be happening before may 20th 2024 um there was a lot of discussion about what the date should be or could right. be and both sides wanted something completely different joe well they did i mean judge cannon of course uh, remember uh, judge cannon had been roundly uh, mm -hmm. uh criticized and rebuked by the conservative 11th circuit for some past decisions so there had been some skepticism of, of her ability to handle this case uh, in a fair and impartial way. Um, but I will tell you, I think most attorneys I spoke with thought that this, the, the Fed's uh, date that they suggested, the end of December, uh, mm -hmm. was probably uh, too soon uh, because of how complex the case was and thought that Donald Trump's suggestion, his attorney's suggestion that it be held after the election in 2025 also unrealistic. I've got to say, again, I, I have, I, I'm an attorney, but I have no grasp of just how complex a case like this could be. When you look at the mountains of evidence that the federal government has against Donald Trump, you look at the mountain of the files, my God, the files, you look at the fact that we're talking about classified documents. It's an extraordinarily 
complicated case. I was always skeptical about the December timeline. I must say May 20th, 2024, um, that seems very reasonable. It seems like a reasonable date. It seems like it's far enough in the future, uh, to be fair uh, to the after defendant. The primary. President Trump. Uh, yeah, politically, it'd be after the primary. But if you're a judge, you're not looking at that. And I, I, I think this date uh, makes an awful lot of sense. So we will see as, uh, as we move forward. But obviously, there's going to be a lot of coverage between now and then. Uh, a lot of dates, uh, obviously, court dates, too. So case in point right here, Republican Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa released a redacted FBI memo yesterday that some Republicans say proves Joe Biden and his son, Hunter, took bribes. Many of these same Republicans also, I'm sure, believe in Jewish space lasers. It involves allegations made by a confidential informant in 2020 about Hunter's alleged business dealings when he served on the board of Ukrainian energy company Burisma. Those claims have never been verified, and even some top Republicans have acknowledged they cannot confirm whether the information is true. Congressman Jimmy Raskin of Maryland, the top Democrat on the House Oversight Panel, yesterday picked apart the claims in a lengthy statement, arguing in part, quote, this FBI document records the unverified, secondhand, years old allegations relayed by a confidential source who stated he could not provide the veracity of these allegations. Raskin also highlights how the source of the information was at the center of a pressure campaign by Rudy Giuliani in 2019 and 2020 on behalf of then President Trump. And when interviewed, the source directly denied these allegations. I, I mean, this is, this is still dossier squared for Republicans. But none of that likely matters to Senator Grassley who last month admitted he said the quiet part out loud, out loud. He didn't care if the allegations were true or not. Take a listen. We aren't interested in uh, whether or not the accusations against Vice President Biden are accurate or not. We're in, responsible for making sure the FBI does its job. G. G. Gene and, and for that it was to, again To, to, to lie about a document, mm -hmm. try, at the time they were talking about, I guess, impeaching Ray or, or whatever, they, 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 Ray talked to him. And again, it's, it's one thing after another after another. Durham supposedly is going to show this conspiracy between the FBI and Hillary Clinton. He makes a fool of himself. You have Comer time and time again, like talking about informants who end up being like Chinese agents uh, or, 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 or foreign. Uh, I don't know exactly what they are, uh, but, but they're, they're doing the business of the Chinese Communist Party illegally. They're funneling Iranian oil, uh, smuggling it illegally to the communist Chinese. They're illegal mm -hmm. arms dealers. You go yeah. down the list, and 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 then you've got these other people who are supposedly these IRS informants who basically get up there and go, yeah, it was actually Donald Trump. And when I was complaining, it was Donald Trump who was president then, 
and it was Trump's uh, IRS and Trump's Justice yeah. Department in 2018. And, yeah, and, and, and here we have a document, that, again, that's, that's complete nonsense. And you have Chuck mm -hmm. Grassley on, I don't care whether he's guilty or not. We're just, we're yeah. just trying to create chaos. Right. The, the, the aim of all this is not to connect the dots. It's just to throw out a whole bunch of dots uh, that don't connect, just to throw, just to try to create this atmosphere around President Biden that he must have done something wrong. On. Um, the, 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 I'm glad you mentioned the IRS agents because, because again, this happened while Donald Trump was president, and so if 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 there were interference in the investigation of of Hunter Biden, which according to the 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 counsel the federal prosecutor who was leading the investigation, there was no interference. He was able to bring whatever charges uh, he wanted to bring. Uh, it was totally his decision. But if if it was being interfered with, it was being interfered with by Donald Trump's Justice Department. It's just insane. Uh, but again, the dots don't connect. They aren't supposed to, as Senator Grassley revealed, they're just supposed to sort of muddy up uh, President Biden and create this this impression that somehow uh, he's done something wrong and he's corrupt um, because the comparison is is inevitably drawn with with Donald Trump. Who actually is corrupt, and and, uh, and and so they have to try to drag Biden down to that level. So Dem Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. testified yesterday before the House Republican-led so-called Weaponization Committee on well, the issue. It's been a bust. Too. It's just. It's incredible. On the issue of censorship, the hearing was often very contentious between Kennedy and the Democrats on the committee who called him a menace to society, who did not deserve the platform Republicans gave him. Kennedy has a long history of making controversial comments, most recently coming under fire from members of his own family for pushing anti-Semitic tropes about COVID. Democratic Congressman Jerry Conley of Virginia gave an especially passionate rebuke of how the Republicans were using Kennedy for cynical political purposes. I've been in this Congress 15 years, and I never th thought we'd descend to this level of Orwellian dystopia. <laughs> Suddenly the tools of the trade are not to get at the truth, but to distract, distort, deflect, and dissemble. To disagree is censorship. To try to correct the facts is to infringe on my right of free speech. And no matter what you may think, Mr. Kennedy, and I revere your name, you're not here to propound your case for censorship. You are here for cynical reasons to be used politically by that side of the aisle to embarrass the current president of the United States, and you're an enabler in that effort today. And it brings shame on a story name that I revere. Ooh. Ooh. You know So, um, Donnie, I, um, known Bobby uh, for a long time. I like him. Mm -hmm. I've always liked him. What's He's going on there? Always been a good guy uh, to me. And, <laughs> um, and um, a smart guy. I remember maybe 20 years ago hearing him give an impassioned speech 
on the environment. And it was a really, really compelling speech. You get gifted, gifted, uh, gifted orator. Uh, and I'm just, I, you can tell, I, I'm sure just like, you know, the family members are at a loss about the anti-Semitic tropes that he's throwing out there at a loss about one conspiracy theory after another. We, we, we're not going to give their names, but we, Meek and I were just, we were having a conversation with people who have been friends with the Kennedys for a very long time. And, you know, they love Bobby Jr. They love him. They love the whole family. And they say he's a very compelling guy, very gifted guy. He can pull you in. And they, too, are at a total loss about this guy being overtaken by one conspiracy theory after another, after another, after another. And I think for for the family members who have sat by quietly all this time, I think the anti-Semitic trope about COVID being targeted, um, genetically I think that was the final straw and of course what Bobby always does is he throws something out there mm -hmm. and then like Trump I, I can't believe I'm saying it but like Trump yeah. when he gets called out on it by the press he goes oh no 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 I never said that mm -hmm. and then you go back and you look at the tape and you see he actually said that and it's always framed in a way where he can pull back if it blows up in his face but what's the danger what's the problem the problem is he has set that anti-Semitic trope and that virus out online. And for all the conspiracy theorists that are following him, that takes root and it grows. And it's Jews who pay for that. It's Jews that pay for that maybe by being shouted at and taunted on the streets. Maybe it's by having a rock thrown at the synagogue. Maybe it's by people going in and shooting up synagogues. I'm talking about just anti-Semitism in general, not about this specific anti-Semitic trope. I'm just saying, though, it is so reckless and irresponsible. And for people who've known Bobby for a long time, uh, much better than me, in fact, uh, it's it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's a, you said the quiet part out loud, the parallels between Trump and Bobby Kennedy Jr. are kind of stunning. They're both very, very charismatic media figures that understand the media. As you said, they'll throw these grenades out and let them explode and then walk away and go, oh, oh, I didn't do anything. And he's taking the greatest family brand name in U.S. history, Kennedy, and dumping all over it and it's just it, you know the Kennedys have had a lot of tragedies over the years but I can't think of any greater blemish than what he's doing out there and I think he's not well I, I mean I think there's something you know you can explain all you want but for him to say to throw out the controversy he throws in this latest anti-semitic trope I think he's fallen and he can't get up and I think there's something very wrong with Bobby Kennedy Jr. and going back to uh, one of the earlier segments in the show, God forbid, this lunatic decides to run as a third party and the damage that that would do. This is a very dangerous guy with a very storied name that is casting a dark shadow over it. Molly, it's been interesting to see, too, how some, I guess, libertarians or conservatives who are done with Donald Trump have sort of put their arms around Bobby Kennedy Jr. as a guy by their perception who, like Trump, Trump is railing against the establishment, questioning uh, uh, received knowledge and conventional wisdom and on and on and on. I mean, he's doing much worse than that. And by the way, this isn't new. The vaccine stuff he's been doing for, for a generation and, and hurt a lot of people with that, his conspiracy theories about vaccines. But it's been interesting how House Republicans have sort of, I don't know, I don't know if they fully embraced him, but they like a lot of what he's saying. Well, they platformed him at this hearing. And the reason that yeah. a lot of conservatives like him is not because they want him to be president. This is a very craven ploy. Remember, they want to have a third party, not because a third party will win. You know, Trump may never win the popular vote. He hasn't ever, right? He just needs to win the Electoral College. And so you get a Bobby Kennedy Jr. on the ticket and you get those votes and you could see another Trump presidency. And so I think ultimately this is really a play to hurt Biden. They know the economy is good. They know that Biden is 
you know, d does pretty well and is pretty electable and tends to overperform. And so this is sort of a desperate ploy to hurt Biden. Yeah, and, 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 and by the way, the Kennedy family <laughs> has gone to uh, the Bidens and let them know they do not support his candidacy. And they understand that it is being cynically used by, terrible. by Republicans, by Donald Trump, by Steve Bannon, by Roger Stone, by all of these people uh, to, to do nothing but actually help anti-democratic forces in America. It's uh, really unfortunate. Not